people are starting to um to join it's three o'clock so john I, I think i'll i'll start and introduce you as people as people are logging on so um delighted to have you here um john woodcock now lord warney um you started your professional life as a journalist became a political and public policy advisor to labor, the then labor government um both to john now lord hutton in the cabinet office the department for work and pensions department for business and energy and then moved to number 10 where you're an advisor to gordon brown uh, you were elected in 2010 as the mp the labor and cooperative mp for barrow and furness and were re-elected twice again um, you're in your final term and i hadn't realized this you gained a master's at king's college I did. Um, and, I did. And also trained as a as a teaching assistant and learned Arabic or are learning Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> remarkable. I mean, well, I, you know, there wasn't really much going on, so I just kind of thought. <laughs> remarkable. I, I I can barely get into the office in a day. <laughs> I'm supremely impressed. Um, the, the teaching and, assistant was was pre uh, was pre um, uh, was in that that first Ed Miliband term, so you no, know, it wasn't all done. Yes. Uh, well, still being an MP and trainer as a teaching assistant, I I, I think deserves uh, deserves mm. appreciation. And you you've since been appointed the UK government's special envoy on countering violent extremism. And I think two days ago now we're we're ennobled. Um, so Lord Warney, as I say, um, an area in your beloved Barrow, Baron Warney of the Isle of Warney in the county of Cumbria. Um, but you know, beyond that, I've known you for the best part of two decades. And yeah. Um, Absolutely. And you have always been um, a, a principled anti-racist, um, outspoken against anti-Semitism. So thank you for, for that. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Um, and, and we'll get on and, and find out more about you. So can you, you've just joined the Lords. What, what's the difference? Can you give us your reflections on the difference between the Lords and the Commons? It does feel it does feel so different. I mean, the the, um, the the tone in here. I mean, we've got this sort of lovely regal backdrop behind, and it's very nice that they've allowed me to sort of perch over the proceedings and speak to you this uh, uh, this evening. It, it, I mean, it it's so it all feels very um, very kind of revered and um, and much in terms of the t the tone of debate i mean i've only sat through the the lords um a little bit um in in these this last sort of 36 hours but it, it it's much more considered and um polite um and of course the whole atmosphere in in the whole of parliament is really different because of the opening up after after covid i mean you and i guess many of the people who are tuning in will be will fami be familiar with that constant hustle and bustle of parliament and that isn't there which which i think whether you're in the lords or the commons um will take some will take some getting getting used to but i mean i am i'm really i'm just delighted to be in here i mean the, the it is it is crazy on a whole number of of, of levels um me being me being ennobled but i i'm I'm really looking forward to the hopefully that 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 culture within the Lords, which in which you know you do it's often overlooked within public life for perfectly often perfectly understandable um, reasons. But you are struck by the 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 incredible level of expertise on any particular subject, which is. Uh, which is which the the lords and the baronesses bring to um, bring to debate, and I'm really hoping to be able to just you know soak up some of uh, and and you know try and under get some great understanding from the you know truly amazing people who are sort of tucked away in this place. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you'll add to that add to that expertise as well. Um, so, I mean, moving on to your, to your role, the, the, you know, great, you grew up in, in Yorkshire, you went to Edinburgh University. Did you have much interaction with the Jewish community or did you have an in interest in anti-racism at that kind of younger age? How yeah. Was that fostered, how was that fostered in you? Well, as you, um, as you alluded to in your introduction, we've known each other for about 20 years and, and, and I got to, to initially to know uh, you when you had slightly more 
hair as the uh, the organizer the organizer for the Union of Jewish Union of Jewish Students, mm-hmm. um, and and so that actually came when I'd sort of I finished it pretty much I'd finished at Edinburgh University and I'd become one of the um, one of the people employed full time um, in running that national. Labour students organisation. So, look. Let, let me be. Um, I mean, let me be totally candid. I was one of the people who had a a sort of lazy, ill-informed, I, I guess, small level sort of prejudice, certainly against the nation of Israel. I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily. But I mean, we, you know, you you are steeped in the in the way that these it, that these issues are interlink. But had this sort of um, ill thought out, you know, sense of of the Israeli nation as being um, you know uh, as being powerful uh, aggressors who were unfair to their neighbours. And I mean, I haven't you know I haven't admitted this before, but I but I remember as a student thinking, oh, you know, you know what, I can't believe they're so mean to the Palestinians. Um, they really should know better from their recent history, which is now, I mean, it bores me that that, that was my, my view, but it, and it wasn't really based on anything in, in particular. But then I guess my, uh, the sea change in my view came from being able to visit Israel. And, um, you know, I think, um, it, it's a huge testament to the union of what the Union of Jewish Students do in terms of their um, sort of future leaders program. It didn't quite work out like that in, in my instance, but I'm still hanging on it at the edges. But that being physically being able to to go over to the to go over to the Middle East and to to see with your own eye the geographical vulnerability of uh, of Israel, and and just to, to just to talk to um, Israelis about their sense of vulnerability and how that is just completely, you are generally just totally ignored and misrepresented by um, Western media in a way which I think probably does filter it into um, some of the you know the anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic troops or prejudices that, that you have. And from that point on, you just sort of it can change my understanding. And I became a, um, a much more switched on to the issues of, um, of, of anti-Semitism. Um, I was exposed to this really appalling anti-Semitism within the Within the student movement at the time, I remember being uh, at NUS conference in Blackpool in 2002. Was that was that were you there by that time? You probably would have yeah. been. I can't remember if Michael was still um, and my then fiance, then wife, now ex-wife. Uh, we still get on really well. Mandy Telford, who was the president of of NUS, um, won um, with. Um, uh, with absolutely critically with critically bought support from from UGS but I remember there was this one young um, block of seven candidate I, I mean she you know she sort of faded from the scene since then but <laughs> I'm joking Luciana Berger was the block of seven candidate and and I remember her standing up in um, the main conference floor and giving this really um, arresting account of the uh, anti-Semitic abuse that she had been subjected to while she was just be, trying to be a delegate of, um, of the UJS. Um, and then we got, um, um, uh, yeah, and, 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 so, and so that was, um, that also, that experience through the National Union of Students really sort of helped expose um, me to, the fact that even back then, you know, this was a really live everyday issue um, experienced by many Jewish people in the stage. Uh, and th- that is before the, um, the awful explosion in, in recent years, particularly on the left, which I'm sure we, you know, we might want to talk about, go on to talk about a bit. That, that's hugely interesting, also important, because I think what you speak to is the fact that, you know, 
people can go on a journey and you know there are there is more anti-semitism out there than there are anti-semites or even people with pre latent prejudice um, yeah. how we engage you know and i think that you visit for you it was visiting israel for some people it's having a jewish friend personalizing yeah. jewry or and or israel in that case actually mm. does make a huge difference and we'll come on to that kind of that education yeah but while, while we were still in your kind of in your in your your past i wanted to look at you know, you said you ran Labour students, you uh, have these roles in Downing Street and, and elsewhere, D even perhaps as an MP, you know, did you did you see anti-Semitism or extremism perhaps as an as an MP or when you were advising? And, and what was kind of what, what was the context and how was it dealt with at that time? And has it changed? Well, I was um... I got the privilege of, of being uh, being able to be, become chair of, of Labour Friends of Israel when I was a um, a, a member of a member of Parliament in in the incredibly sad circumstance of taking over from David Cairns when when he when he lost his life and um, and so your ex so experience the experience as a as a as a new MP was. Um, just seeing how in policy debates and within the Labour Party and, you know, within, frankly, even back then, some people in pretty senior positions within the Labour Party who should have known better, and I won't go into any more, that where Israel was constantly being held to different standards uh, than uh, the rest of any other country in the world. And there was... And ultimately, there was no explanation for that than uh, it being rooted in, in viewing Jewish people differently and the, the home of the Jewish and the home of the Jewish people and um, putting that to different and unrealistic and negative standards to um, to the rest of the um, uh, to the rest of the world. So that was that was formative. Um, I represented a constituency, uh, Barrow and Furness, which is um, still still consider our, our our home. Where actually, I don't know. There's been a new census, and you know, I haven't checked on the on the 2011 census. Census there were 19, one nine people uh, who uh, defined themselves as Jewish on there. And I sort of think that you know many of them may have been just sort of on a holiday from Manchester at the time because it, it is uh, Barrow was a is a um extraordinarily un um undiverse. It is ninety nine point four percent white British so a very few places that are but you know the way again the way that that the, so the, my experience of anti Semitism in that context um was was not Jewish constituents um, experiencing it because I, I I never met anyone who I, I'm sure I must have met Jewish constituents I guess but I never never knowingly so and never um, and never raised you know, Jewishness or anti-Semitism as part of any issue that they raised but you know I remember some of my constituents were not you know I didn't put them as bad people but you know on Facebook they'd be sort of like sharing sort of oh you know the Rothschilds are doing this and when you pulled them up on it they were like hey what do you mean anti-semitism what do you mean Jews no I'm talking about the Rothschilds um and and so just that that blanket of ignorance um in which um it, it, in which nevertheless it's never sort of ignorance which ends up you know people just feeling that Jewish people are, are great people. Too. It's always ignorance which which fuels negative opinions, um, which is you know which, which you guys know far far better than me is is the 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 this the ancient prejudice um, which still just manifests itself in people who don't even understand necessarily what an anti-Semitism is, and yet they sort of you know they they will just power those tropes. Yeah, it's fascinating, especially, you know, during the pandemic, seeing those tropes, the Rothschild tropes, the Soros tropes circulating online yeah. and QAnon. Um, but yeah. again, we'll yeah. come to that too. 
Um, moving on, you, you cited anti-Semitism in your resignation letter. What did it mean for you as a Labour MP, you touched this earlier, seeing anti-Semitism in the party in, in such a, a widespread way? And, and it's still there, obviously, in some corners. So, so what, what, yeah. did it, what can, what should we do about it? What do you expect the EHRC, the forthcoming EHRC report to say? Yeah. And so let me say at the start that there were people um, who views I respect profoundly and who I would still want to consider um, my, my dear friends uh, who uh, are Jewish and have been in, uh, have battled in this field in their professional lives and have experienced it in their personal lives far more than me who chose to stay in the Labour Party. Um, and so, I, I, and it's really important that I say that because I, I, I don't want, you know, um, in any way to sort of, you know, get this sort of sense of, of being this non-Jew coming in and saying, you know, this was the only right thing, the only right thing to do. Because I know that there were people who, who agonized about, about this and I don't know what was the right thing in terms of in terms of people leaving or 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 not i i think the right thing the right thing now is that is is i hope that we can actually remember that we were sort of you know we were all on and are all on the same side in terms of what we want our objectives to be it's just that you, many of us took a uh t took a we, people took different views to what ultimately ended up being a binary choice in in in, in that sense and you know, and, and, and the world goes on. But for me, for my, my personal view was, it was, it, it, I, I thought and I think um, that um, sufficient numbers of, of, of what Jeremy Corbyn has said and did over the time uh, and his actions, there were, there were so many actions views expressed that were clearly anti-semitic um that i, I, I even at its bond has considered this to be an anti-semitic regime at the top of the uh, of the labor party even if you don't go into you know individuals is this person anti-semitic or not i have my clear view on that i'm not gonna uh, i probably uh, i'll probably draw you can probably guess what my view is i'll draw my like the, the line of that so and, and for me it's like well if you if you're not profoundly moved by by that, um, and you do not want to take a stand on that, then, then I mean, what are you what are you in politics for? Notwithstanding that many people took a stand and stayed, I I, I, I get that, but it, it, it I just didn't. It, it just it's never been my politics to kind of say, well, you know. Uh, yes, he is an anti-Semite, but you know we've got to make sure we beat the Tories. Well, I, well, what do you mean? Yes, he is, but it's a but there were there were bigger things that were on. There aren't bigger th there aren't you know bigger things than than um, than that uh, than that within within that within that context. And so, um, I in the that and and I and I mentioned anti-Semitism as part of the, as one of the reasons I, why I left and I was you know I, I was um, uh, really close and a profound amount of respect for some of the MPs who who, who did leave uh, for whom anti-Semitism was the prime issue for me it was alongside um, court, the Corbyn Labour, Corbyn and his and his acolytes' view of of national security, of Britain's place in the world, of attitudes towards Russia, of of attitudes towards uh, Islamists, um, the idea that you, I mean, the the idea that you would you would you would lay a wreath at the 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 uh, grave of, of one of the people who who massacred in the most grotesque way. Jewish athletes because they were Jewish and, and, and that that wouldn't just profoundly blow apart what it means to be in mainstream politics and within that organization. Uh, it, it was just alien to me. So 
Um, so all of that made, made it for me a kind of a pretty simple decision. Many people agonize about this and they left. And many people agonize as, about, as, about they stay. And frankly, I'm really glad that some of the people stayed who did because it did enable, make it easier, did help in terms of being able to, to, to defeat that faction. But for me, it was never really a particularly hard decision because I, I, could, I just couldn't. I couldn't have, have, have put my name. I mean, I, I got into, it was a miracle really that I ended, I stayed as an MP in 2017 because I had been, uh, you know, many people were, were talking about what to do about Corbyn and, you know, you have your WhatsApp groups who are saying, what should we do? Uh, you know, we can't let this happen. And then suddenly Theresa May calls the 2017 election. And it, I'm a, I remember saying at the time, okay, but hey guys, we said we couldn't let this happen. So what are we going to do about it? And then the re received view from everyone, everyone but me was like, oh yeah, no, you're right. But it's just sort of too late. So we just got to get through this. And I said in 2017, um, I want to be a Labour candidate, but on no account will I make that man prime minister. So if it came down to it, in a vote, I will not vote for him and the Labour Party will have to put someone else. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to support uh, that a government led by him in, in, um, it, it, in a vote of in a vote of confidence, and I mean, just the stars aligned, and they just didn't quite have time to kick me out. I mean, if it had been a slightly longer campaign, or they, had, you know, they they would have um, they would have disbarred me from from standing. And even as it was, there was this decision deal made basically in twenty seven in twenty seventeen. Um, I think largely brokered by Tom Watson to his credit that you know all of the Corbyn critics of which there were many, many, uh, you know, the vast majority of his shadow cabinet had resigned the year before, but all of those people who they didn't like would all be rubber stamped as candidates. We'd just go through uh, because we'd run out of time. Even with that proposal on the table, the, the Labour Party's National Executive Committee, the ruling body of the Labour Party, still there were still people who tried to say, yeah, but accept him. <laughs> and they had to have a vote on yes, but accept me, which I think, I don't know, I think it was pretty tight. I squeezed through. And, even, and then it was like, well, you can't win. Um, in, uh, I represented Barrow, um, which uh, many of you all know is the home of, uh, of nuclear submarine building. Uh, it builds nuclear sub submarines that are nuclear powered, but which, which hold the UK's nuclear deterrent. You had a man in Jeremy Corbyn who opposed this for literally four decades. In my view, there was no chance. Uh, but I spent the whole campaign running against Jeremy Corbyn and managed to sort of to squeak in. That's a very long answer, but it, for me it was just, well... It, it, it was just the obvious thing to do. That, look, I mean, people will, will take their view on whether whether people should have, it was right to leave or right to stay, but I don't think anyone could say that you didn't speak your mind uh, and, that, and that, you know, you, you spoke truth to power, as it were. Thank um, you. So I, I, on that point, you've been appointed as this special envoy for the UK yeah. countering violent extremism. So firstly, how did, how did that come about and, and how do you plan to work? You're, you're, the, you're completing our suite of, of envoys and advisors, you know, Lord Pickles, Lord Mann, uh, yeah. Salah Khan, Imam Karyasin. So how did it come about and how, we, how do you plan to work with, with those other uh, advisors? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. Um, as, uh, in terms of how it came about, as I was leaving, uh, as I was leaving Parliament, um, I was um, I was approached to ask if I, uh, by the people around the Prime Minister if I would like to do something in this field because they were aware um, that I'd I'd done a fair bit as an MP and I was one of the sort of fairly unusually as as a um, as an opposition MP had tried to work constructively with the government on toughening up some of their um, uh, some of the, the the laws and the framework against uh, violent extremism, and I and, and I was I was always sort of bothering and you know working really well with security ministers in sort of talking about issues about counter terrorism and the and the return of um, uh, of Daesh um, UK Daesh supporters from so I'd done a fair bit on that. So they they, they asked if if I would. Um, like to do the job and uh, and it was to be based around um, broadly around a review um, of various aspects of, of, of counter-terror so 
I thought that would that be a fascinating thing to do. Privilege to be back, and you know, I, I you sort of you, you mentioned my my background of, of sort of three or four years as an advisor in government, and I mean there is, you know, there is nothing like actually being part of being able to try and shape decisions, and and I really missed it from being in a, in and from frontline parliamentary life, always been in opposition. Um, and governing is difficult. It can be particularly difficult when, you know, things are going against you as, as it was in the, obviously in those final years of a, of, of a Labour government. But, but you can actually get in, involved in into the heart of issues and you can change stuff. And, and so the prospect of being able to uh, delve into the kind of issues and write a review for the government, really attractive. That, so, so that was like back November time last year when it was announced. Um, here I am sort of, you know, 10 months later, nothing really has been seen. And what, so what has happened since then is, um, uh, so, okay, so the Home Office says, right, great, we've got this um, letter from the, uh, from our boss, the Home Secretary, and uh, and Prime Minister saying they want you to become the uh, special member. That's wonderful. You're not an MP anymore, so here's your form to fill out the uh, security clearance, uh, right? Okay, um, which you, which you do, and then it kind of like so it took ages, ages for my security. I mean, not not for any reason. You know, I, I tried to say, look, I was actually really highly security clear when I was when I was. Can you just not take my answers from more than ten years ago? No, you have to redo it. So okay, so the process is just a long process, and so when I eventually get my security clearance, I'm just about starting to talk about doing stuff, and then COVID hits, and um, we rightly took it. it, it took it. They took. They wanted me to accept their view, which I readily did. That the, all this stuff just had to be parked in the immediate uh, national emergency. Um, so that was absolutely um, that was absolutely the right thing to do. And then it's just taken um, a while and sort of you know some kind of change of the personnel to 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 get stuff going and there was a sense of of you know look could you could you change your focus because initially um this was part of the job was going to be um well the overwhelming majority of the job was looking externally internationally and you were it was a mix of understanding how some of our international partners uh what they were doing in the county violence extremism space uh, what seemed to be working, were there pointers for UK policy on that? And then also an element of representing the uh, the UK's approach to this, where, you know, with things like... Um, uh, we're, uh, with things like the contest uh, strategy and the prevent programme, uh, although there are a, a, an, you know, a disproportionately loud minority of voices who are who are critical of it in the UK and I've had thus far, I think a disproportionate influence um, in the UK political landscape. Um, that approach the UK has adopted is seen as streets ahead of many, um, uh, of, of many of our allies. And so actually they're interested in, in learning more. And, and so the idea was I could help showcase, I could help um, the UK government showcase uh, its approach. So, but then all of that, you know, is now can't be done at the moment. So there is there is a process uh, which I'm hoping is sort of nearing completion uh, to recalibrate what I'm uh, going to be going to be doing, and and you know broadly, um, it will be looking at um, uh, the, any change, new challenges coming out of uh, the COVID situation, of which. Um, you know, there are obviously some very obvious ones that um, are being explored and probably need need some more thinking about. That's really interesting. Um, I, I just wanted to start to say that when, when looking at, say, Prevent, are you, would that be a kind of a warts and all thing saying to country, look, this is this is the programme, this is some of the, the things that don't work, this is some, some of the things that do work. It was kind of a whole package. As it yeah, was. well, that's a good question. I, I don't know. Bluntly, I, I, don't, I don't know what... The Home Office approach would be. I mean, it tend, I think you're, yeah, um, because there would have been, so you've got this, 
on on the one hand, you um, the prevent program is 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 much more established and credible and seen as much more credible and thought leading by some of our international partners than it is in the UK. Um, alongside that, uh, there is the commitment to um, review the programme, uh, which again was something which was sort of delayed for a number of, of reasons and will, now, uh, and will now go ahead. And so that sort of reflection on how to, to change the, uh, how to change the programme and adapt um, and will be informed by the independent review. And, um, um, and I, so I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, you would hope there would need to be an element of, uh, of both of it, but you've been in, in foreign office FCO type environments. I mean, you know, we do, we do like to, to, to bang the drum for the UK. So I'd imagine there would be, a fair, would have been a fair bit of that. That's brilliant. Well, some of this is obviously it, it, these questions were written with that kind of the, the global perspective in mind, but obviously they're yeah, of course, understood. So, you know, I mean, Sara Khan talked about the negative impact of extremism on democracy. Do you yeah. see that impact kind of across the world? And, and in what way is extremism in the UK kind of unique uh, compared to those manifestations worldwide? You mentioned you mentioned Sarah Khan, and uh, uh, just before I go into that, I should also add that you know I, I'm a huge um, supporter of what uh, I'm a big supporter of what Sarah um, Sarah Khan um, is is doing through the commission. And one of the um, the first things I did when the role was um, was, was announced was to uh, get in touch with her. I mean, we we we, we our paths have crossed. Um, when I was a member of the Home Affairs Committee, looking at looking at these issues, but just to make clear that you know that I I really valued what what her and the Commission were were doing and wanted to to support it and not sort of you know trip over it in uh, if, if that were so. But I, I mean, I um, this is, this is not so. This is not part of my um, formal brief for government, but it it, it, it is a um it, it, it's a profoundly important question and um i think one of the things that you are you are seeing uh, in different ways across uh across the world often in more established democracies like our own um are sort of new or more energized ways to try to um to uh, erode faith in the democratic process, in democratic institutions, um, which either through either deliberately or um, yeah, either by intent or um, by um, broadly unintended con consequence can give uh, extremism uh, and extreme views the um, uh, the space to uh, to flourish because you know when you have um, um, when you when you have actors within the UK to an extent uh, or the US for, um, to an extent enabled by foreign actors um, that who are um, uh, who are very deliberately trying to erode people's faith in, in, uh, in, in news sources, in, in the veracity of what they, uh, of what they hear, then uh, of what they hear from uh, established, uh, established actors, then the likes of the, of the, the conspiracy theories become much easier to, um, uh, to, to disseminate. I, I noted, um, you know, it's not specifically part of my, it's not part of my, my brief, but I, I noted that the Treasury Department in the US has, uh, just within the last week, um, has sanctioned a, um, uh, uh, placed sanctions on a member of the Ukrainian parliament for, um, uh, for what they, what they have decided is essentially acting as, as an actor for Russia in, in misinformation, in the misinformation space. Now, you know, that is not something which, uh, to my knowledge, the UK government has has commented on but it, it, it is it is worth noted that um that, that an organization like the us as it is approaching its its elections is 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 looking 
at those issues to try to ensure the continued integrity of its uh, of its democratic process, which is really you know which which is fundamentally important. Yeah, well, and, and you know, you talk about conspiracy theories. So, so beyond this, there's the impact on democracy through fake news. Do you think they're having a wider impact in the in the kind of the extremism landscape? Because to me, at least, you know, if someone engages in a conspiracy theory, we saw it in the United States with the Pizzagate affair. Somebody, you yeah. know, online sees what essentially legal but harmful content and can get pulled down this rabbit hole in yeah. the, of extremism. So, so do you do you think that's we have a wider danger there in respect of? of... When you look at what um, many government ministers have been trying to do for uh, for years in terms of their um, uh, the dialogue with uh, social media companies and um, and and the the overall and and I, I know that a lot of work is is going on is going on now and so, and I don't want to. There are just there are sort of really live and active discussions with social media with social media companies. But what you but that you you pinpoint the problem of um, of the gateway uh, for people who um, and 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 trying to prevent that that uh, that gateway to to extreme views where people go, oh, what you know, there's a there's something going on with pizzas and in, in, in DC, what's this about click? And then, uh, uh, and, and finding themselves sort of drawn, drawn further and further. And certainly historically, um, as we were looking as a member of the home, home affairs committee over the last, over the last few years, uh, that was a, um, that was a huge problem. And, and, um, uh, the, uh, and, and so, Social media companies who uh, whose business models are um, uh, are entirely based around getting more people engaged in in content, uh, more people clicking through, and therefore more opportunities for um, for advertisers um, do have a real responsibility. Uh, and the government has 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 for you know some years now. Uh, understood its responsibility to try to set the formal or informal framework um, that that um, that means that that what are supposed to be mainstream platforms for just mainstream engagement by everyday people everyday uh, by folks going about their everyday life do not just suddenly flash up the really dangerous and harmful and distorted views uh, we, I, mean, I should have said earlier, but people are able to ask questions via the Q&A function on, on Zoom. Someone's asked the, on, on extremism and mental health, you've spoken out about mental health before, like it, it, especially in the pandemic, both in respect yeah. of fighting extremism um, and I suppose being on the receiving end of it. How can people ensure that they, kind of, they, they can have, be in good mental health given how difficult that can be? Yeah. Have you got any pointers? No, it, it's it is a really it's a really good question, uh, and it's something that I would I would like to study in in more depth and understand um, where the the government is in in more depth. So, I mean, uh, so let me let me answer this this personally uh, if I can. In that um, you can, I mean, I have seen from so many people. Um, who are sort of on the re on the the receiving end of extremist views? You know what an important part. You know what a terrible uh, impact that can have on your uh, on your mental health. And um, you know, I, I was uh, I, I have you know as you, your um, the question question alluded to. I mean, I'm someone who's spoken out about mental health in the past, and I've I've been a uh, I, I I have been I am an I guess I'm still intermittently a sufferer of, of poor mental health, and I have to work. Uh, I work quite hard to try to ensure that I am resilient. And I remember going in to um, the uh, part of the MP's well-being service, um, and you know, uh, during a particularly difficult time. And she, uh, she said, "Look, I don't know why you people with, with public profiles actually." go on social media at all because it's just you, you, I think I think maybe Isabel 
uh, my other half who wrote a book on how uh, how to get the wrong uh, why we get the wrong politicians. Um, uh, I think she may have, but but basically, the, the, you said, well, is it like um, it, it's like you, you you go and you and forgive, please forgive the you you um you la- I'll put it you lather honey on 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 delicate regions of your body and then you stick them in front of a load of bees uh to be stung and and it can sort of feel like sometimes you know when you are when you're out there and you've got these social media platforms which do for which they're great strength and why they've been designed is that they are they are a leveler it does allow people to uh, to come in and so in terms of you know, resilience. Um, I am a great believer now in sort of, you know, turning off your some of your 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 comments and and um, and and just in th- that sort of basic practice. And I remember Izzy saying to me, "Look, why are you looking at, the, at this stuff late at night? Um, you would not um, allow a bunch of near do wells." Um, she didn't put it in those terms, but I will um, to to stand at the bottom of our bed and shout obscenities at us. So why are you logging into Twitter? So th- that sort of basic health issue uh, in terms of recipients of, of abuse. But then, you know, there, I- there is, I think, a, um, a, a, a del- clearly a delicate and a, and a complex relationship between um, you, uh, the people's, some people's mental health and um, and the way that they that they go on to express extreme views, and I, and I don't want to get to at this stage. Probably, you know, it's not helpful to get too drawn into that because there is the, there is the um, I, I'm I'm a, I'm aware of of the frustration of, of you know sometimes where you know, uh, people who are just you know have done very done very very have done appalling things have said appalling things and then you know mental health is, is sort of seen as a, as a kind of shield um shielding them from actually proper responsibility for their their actions and i, th- and I think we need to be alive to that however you know clearly that that um clearly that there are there are many incidences of 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 people who um who act in very extreme ways uh who would be diagnosed um with um uh, highly problematic mental health uh, but i think that's right i think that's right not just in, in respect of extremism but you know you look at gambling you look at you know there are various areas yeah. where mental health play, plays a part and, and we've got a lot more to do systemically um mm. to address that I just uh, just before I get there's been another question coming, but just before I get to that, just on on social media, so we we had publicised that you were coming on, and a number of far left sites have, have attacked you before, and they kind of trolled us, and I I highly suspect that a number of them have not logged on to the call to come and, and ask you about this, but I will because because I think I think that's a better way to do it. So you've yeah. been to Saudi Arabia, yeah, a number of yeah. these far left sites attacked you for doing so, saying you were too close to Saudi or you hadn't appropriately balanced your comments. And others said, you know, you, you were defend, defending, defending Turkey as a British ally. You weren't kind of, you know, appropriately criticizing Turkish leadership. So are you happy to kind of to clarify mm. that irrespective of whoever anyone is or whatever the country you will address the, the the extremism you know it might be erdogan you know employing anti-jewish tropes or it might be you yeah. know, funding of, of jihadism it doesn't matter to you because I, I mean from from all well, that, that's, that's the case well in um i think the, the uk government uh I, I think has long understood it it has a responsibility to um to stand up to extremism um, wherever um, uh, wherever it is, and um, uh, one of the ways in which the UK state uh, can do that is to be a um, a beacon in countering extremism and leading by example. There are all the the um, there is has been always will be I think a um, a complex. Um, uh, debate um, relationships that are fostered between uh, 
between countries that do have um, profoundly uh, different uh, cultural outlooks in in many ways. Um, and part of any um, uh, part of any equation is um, the uh, how how the relationships that the UK forges helps to protect the national security of its citizens, um, and uh, it, and also whether the uh, relationships that you forge can. Um, can move uh, particular countries uh, in a more progressive uh, direction um, that simply closing the door or maintaining more negative relationships with them uh, would do. And look, I mean, there is no, um, there is no science to this. And I very much understand differing views on, you know, on all of the, on, on both of the countries that you've, um, you've mentioned and 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 many others um but you know so i guess as a as a pointer let's look at um the um the accord of understanding that's been um signed between israel and the united Arab emirates emirates um when the, this last week where um your great friend and mine danny uh, tony blair clearly had a, a um, <laughs> sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you on that. I don't know, I don't know. My great friend, my great friend, Tony, uh, uh, Tony Blair, um, uh, clearly played, clearly played a role. Now, I think that is, is, it's not an example which, which uh, it, it directly involves the, the, the UK at all, but it, but it, I think it is an example of, um, uh, of a, a country Israel, um, which for many decades has fostered different levels of alliance and understanding with countries um, that have had different levels of hostility, remain different levels of hostility to it as a nation, uh, to Jews as a group of uh, as a group of people, and um, and in, in the instance of uh, of, um, of of the last week, it's you know that 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 approach, which you know I'm sure it would was in every instance was sort of highly controversial on the side. It has has had a, its overarching purpose, and uh, and in that particular instance, has had a step forward. So, you know, in terms of me believing, maintaining that the um, Saudi Arabia is a really important ally of the United Kingdom, despite the fact that we are pol remain poles apart on, on some really important uh, issues. Um, and, um, and, and my hope, my hope that, um, uh, that, that, that Erdogan in, in Turkey uh, will remain um, uh, an ally and a part of NATO, rather than uh, and 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 not uh, and not drift into the sphere of or, uh, further into sphere of of uh, of um, unhelpful issues that you have mentioned uh, uh, into the sphere of Russia, for example. Um, you know that that requires a level, I think, of uh, of of engagement, um, which is in the best interest of of the of the things, uh, including the fight against extremism, anti-Semitism, that we all hold dear. Yeah, I mean, my my view has always been, you know, that that if there are to be discussions with, you know, be it China, Russia, wherever, that so long as those those things are challenged and challenged head on, that mm. that that to me is is extremely important. Um, yeah. Nicole has asked, what should the new counter-extremism strategy look like? And what are the key challenges in the CVE, counter and violent extremism space? Um, I, I'm, uh, it, it's a very big question. Uh, and it is one of which uh, I, am not, uh, I am not speaking for the, um, uh, the government on. Um, uh, let, let me just give you, so let me just give you some sort of um, personal um personal reflections in in you know in my part of the 
in my part of the landscape, uh, landscape as I hope it will develop in in the in the next few months. I mean, I, I think that um, the, one of not necessarily for a UK CV strategy, but for countries like the UK seeking to counter violent extremism, um, it's going to be a hugely important thing uh, not to take our eye off the the ball the ball and effectively to allow uh, the issue to go um to reduce in priority as we um wrestle with um global pandemic and um and the uh, uh, and the the economic disruption that the whole world is 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 experiencing because you know the 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 two issues of um, of the health crisis uh, and uh, and the, the the restrictions on contact uh, on, on contact and um, the incredibly the much more difficult living situations economic situations that the UK and a whole you know every country in the world is going to be experiencing um, can potentially be a real um, breeding ground for an up upswing in uh, extremism so you know i um you know my contribution to this uh, my, i hope is going to be able to to give some uh, analysis um on um on how that is manifesting it uh, how that is manifesting itself where the pinch points could be you know look i i'm not speaking with a level of, of, of a particular level of expertise um uh, at the moment, but you, but I mean, I think we can. You can all see anecdotally the um, uh, the, the the threat of having um, people um, m more socially isolated. We've long understood um, the the harmful gateway that that um, the internet can be to extremism. If you've got people who are spending more time. Um, uh, online, then that makes the uh, makes um, the suite of protections that you have to be able to um, ward people away from that level of uh, from that kind of extremism all the more um, uh, all the more important. Um, it uh, puts increased pressure on the um, on the ability to be able to. Um, uh, spot where people may be being drawn into extremism because if you're not seeing them face to face then obviously you, you know, then, then that has for so long been a natural way in which people might pick up changes um, so um, a reduction in face to face contact by various services means an extra challenge in, in how to uh, to spot extremism uh, the world already you are seeing um, um anti-vax um uh sentiments being drawn up that the the um the, the sense that you know health data should ought to be dismissed and questioned and health rules ought not to be followed and and if and you can imagine that there will that you know that there will be groups who will step up their um d their desire to disrupt um and weaken nations by um uh, by going into that information space to degrade people's um trust in um uh, trust in health guidance in um uh, in, in when we do get a vaccine in in the in, in the vaccine in, in in taking the the, the vaccine and can do a real level of of damage on on that on that front, so that's one of the areas that I'm going to be interested in uh, in, in looking at as the as my work program gets reestablished. That's really helpful. And Alan had actually asked about you know new forms of extremism and and mm. threaten society in the immediate future, and I presume that's what you are talking to those kind of those so, uh, online threats, um, health based threats, to, threats to democracy. And so yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into the uh, into the guts of this. I wish that I, that I, I would love to come back and uh, and and talk to you. Um, you know, when, when you'll have me some months down the track, when we've actually got some of this uh, some of this work um, properly uh, underway. Because at the moment, I'm in the 
position of talking about you know the areas that i that i'm looking to to go into rather than bringing a particular level of of of, of knowledge having done the analysis well I, I mean we're coming towards the end i'll just get a couple more questions um someone asked were the attacks on you um uh, far left extremism and I, I put this question to Sarah Khan around you know people are saying that JK Rowling's an extremist they're saying that the people that are um, uh, attacking are anti-free speech extremists or they think I'm an extremist because I want regulation of the online online space have we lost all meaning of the word now do people just throw about extremism do you think yeah that it's a it's a good question and it's one that I, ha I haven't considered in the way that Sarah Khan will have considered this in terms of definitions of extremism but clearly there, there is a um I, I mean I I wouldn't you, I wouldn't put it to start clear to saying there is there is no um the word has no meaning clearly it, it does have meaning but I think we are right to be um uh, to guard against that kind of um uh, that kind of degrading and and and, and cheapening and I, and I um, you know I am profoundly concerned on a on you know on a on a, on a number of levels, not least seeing uh, uh, a woman I uh, a woman I uh, you know really um, really re woman a woman women I really expect being being called extremism extremists because um, they are taking or advancing or exploring a particular view um, in a in what is a, uh, a to my mind a a, a, a complex and a, an emotive and difficult issue on, um, on on the transgender debate and I don't think that helps um, that helps any um, uh, anyone on uh, uh, on on that front it, on on the issue of 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 far of far left extremism um, yeah i mean i i think people are um when this comes up people will say well look you know look at the balance of uh look at the balance of risks and actually if you look at at, at the balance of of risk as it has been in recent years by our, by the government and security services people uh, it, we mustn't use sight of the fact that islamism remain remained uh the largest threat but the biggest growing threat has, threat has been the the far right, uh, and so understanding how that is growing and what and how are we equipped to tackle with it, tackle it really important. I mean, I think the you know issues of far left extremism uh, is probably something that we need to think about uh, and and talk about more. And it may be an issue that in which um, the, uh, the 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 recalibrated review that I'm going to be doing um, is, is is picking up. Well, look, finally, then, you know, what does success look like? Ten years down the line, do you think we'll be able yeah. to be dealt with extremism? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, dealing is a, is a, <laughs> is a, is a, is an ongoing, is an ongoing process. We, it, it, democracies and um, uh, w there is always going to be a, d a debate between any kind of societies uh, over what views are acceptable and what views are outside and extremism that is the nature of having a uh, a set of views and a set of rules and a culture which to which we are adhere. so you this is ne never something which can be beaten but i you know i hope that what we are uh that what i can make a really small contribution to is just um renewing updating the tools and the outlook on this issue um, for today's uh, threats, which are, um, you know, which, which are changing, they change in their nature and they change in the in the way in which and they can be applied um, so uh, so quickly as te as te as technology um, it acts as a sort of disruptor, accelerator for the ways in which we in which we live our lives. But I'm really excited to be part of this world, and anyone. Uh, who's listened to this, who's got things like, or oh, they think I'm talking total nonsense in one or I'm missing or but you know, please do get in touch. Um, drop me a line. because I am really interested to hear uh, from people's perspectives on what we ought to be looking at. That's really, that, that's fantastic, John. It's been a real 
look, it's an education, it's been interesting, it's exciting um, to hear about, you know, the, the, the prospect of this work. Um, you know, we'll take you up on having you back in the year it's sort of time when we can do it in person, hopefully, um, yes. and, uh, and learn more. I should say our Zoom with a View is taking a break for a couple of weeks. We've got an event on Monday at Labour Party Conference, myself and Karen Pollock from Holocaust Educational Trust with Kate Green and Jess Phillips looking at online harm. That's at 4 p.m. and details are on the Anti-Semitism Policy Trust Twitter at Anti-Sem Policy. Uh, there will be an event at Conservative Party Conference um, with details to follow and everyone who's tuned in will get emailed that but John um, thank you so much for giving us your time today um, really excited uh, to see what you you do in the future congratulations again on your ennoblement your elevation um, and uh, look forward to, to working with you over the next 20 years absolutely great to talk to you Danny really good to oh. see you thank you everyone thanks for tuning in okay bye, bye. bye now.